Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming to this talk. Uh, my name is Shashi, uh, I am a PhD student, I'm, going, I'm in my fifth year now at, uh, at the Julia lab at MIT. Uh, my lab originally created the Julia language and uh, I work on Julia, uh, I mean I work on uh, the symbolic programming language uh, inside Julia. Um, so I, I started working on Julia in 2014 as a uh, GSOC student. I've uh, been working with Julia since. Um, so like I, I, did, I worked as a software engineer for four years with Julia Computing and uh, the Julia Lab. Now I'm, the, uh, I'm a PhD student. Uh, um, my advisor is Alan Edelman. Um, and uh, my, these are my collaborators whose work I will be demonstrating today as well. Um, yeah, um, so this talk is about uh, uh, this thing I call symbolic numeric programming. So what does it actually mean? So in, so, so in simple terms, it is uh, basically taking numerical code and running it with symbols. And, and we, I wanted to explore what you can do with this approach. Um, and concretely, this talk is about this package called symbolics.jl. It's a Julia package, and the slogan is a it's a fast modern CAS for a fast modern language. CAS means a computer algebra system. Um, so, yeah. So, Julia is a numerical computing language, um, and numerical computing involves running math on computers. Uh, so. If you were a programmer in the 1950s, uh, you would first do the math on a piece of paper and write code in maybe Fortran and then uh, have it compiled to machine code. Um, and back then, subroutines were like a new invention. So like uh, you would write this subroutine and then it would fit into some kind of differential equation solver and then you would feel very good about it, right? Um, and this is, uh, this is still how pe many people write numerical code today. Um, and uh, uh, so writing code to do your differential equations um, solving is still very simple. Um, but we also have, um, if you did this, maybe after 1970s, you would have uh, some modeling language, like maybe you were using Lisp, or these days you can use uh, Simulink or Modelica or something like that to model your equations. And that system will compile it down to something that runs on the machine. This could be something like a C, uh, C program or something like that, which is completely outside the language because these languages are very high level. Um, so now, if you compile it down to C, uh, you're giving up the advantage of being able to use your own ecosystem. Um, but if you're compiling to Julia, uh, you can always use Julia functions inside Julia functions. So like there is this nice closure you get. Um, so I, I also said that people still write code like this because it's actually easy to write code like this rather than model equations directly. Uh, so you can write for loops, for example, inside this function. and uh, have it create a bunch of equations, right? Um, so it, it is actually beneficial to take code and run it with symbols and get back the equations and then manipulate the equations. And then you can do things like, uh, you can turn it back into code. And in this case, uh, this was a function which is allocating an array with three elements, right? Uh, so this is an array expression in Julia and it has three elements. But just by converting into math and then converting it back into code, we can ask the second step to make it in place. So in this case, yeah, it's actually taking an input array and then writing three elements to it. So here it's not actually allocating a new array. So if a differential equation solver can give it a fixed amount of memory and then do it for, use, it, use the same memory for every step, then you've avoided about 10,000 allocations here, right? Because for every second of in simulating a certain system, you're probably going to set, run this function about 10,000 times or something like that. Um, 
So, yeah, I want to switch gears and talk about uh, how Symbolics works. Symbolics, the symbolic programming language, symbolic programming package. Um, it's very simple on the surface. It, you, you have this macro called at variables. You give it like a bunch of variable names and it creates those variables. And then any arithmetic you do on that will return symbolic expressions. So here I'm doing x plus x plus y and it's already simplifying it to 2x plus y. Uh, it's assuming that uh, you, know, uh, you can do it. Uh, sometimes it might also give you y plus 2x. That's because uh, it, it sorts things in hash order. <laughs> uh, so it's actually assuming that plus is also commutative. And here it's making an even, uh, I guess, even more blasphemous assumption that x is never 0 and it's returning 2. But um, so by default, the implicit types of x and y is real. And for real types, we just do this. And there is another type which you can use for safety. It's called literal real. If you use this, then it does not simplify. So it's just like basically this package is constructing these expressions as you do arithmetic on it. Um, and then there is this nice function called build function to which you give a, a symbolic expression and then the inputs uh, you want. Uh, and it returns a Julia function which runs this symbolic expression with the inputs. Um, yeah. And uh, in symbolics, you can also have uh, array variables. Uh, I, will get, um, I will have a more detailed exposition of array variables later, but this here is uh, a matrix of size five by five, and uh, this is a vector of length five. And if you do operations on these things, it returns symbolic expressions. So a backslash x is uh, backslash is a way of saying solve. Uh, it's the same in MATLAB if you know this. Um, so it's saying uh, solve a for x, and then this should be a vector of length five because of the sizes of the inputs there. And then you can write a star a star x, and by default it parenthesizes a star x, but you can also do it the other way, um, which is less efficient, but uh, uh, yeah. And when you call build function on array expressions, it tries to do it as, uh, as fast as possible. Uh, so it, he, in this case, it's calling linear algebra dot mul, which is actually a blast call, blast, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's like a, it was actually first written in the 50s, and we still, we still use it. It's like a basic linear algebra subroutines, like multiplication is implemented there, and uh, uh, there are many BLAST implementations. It's kind of a standard, and um, it tries to use all sorts of uh, optimization techniques to do the things that need to be fast very fast. So here it's a matrix vector, vector multiply. So when we do compile a build, func uh, call build function on something that can be run in BLAST, it tries to do that. Um, so coming back to the Lorenz example I was showing, um, you can take this function that uh, it's, it's not in place, it's out of place, uh, in that it's allocating a new array. Uh, you run it with a vector variable and this t is actually never used, but usually that's convention uh, to pass in the time. Where, uh, so it returns a vector of uh, expressions in this case. And then you can call build function on the vector of expressions. And you can say in place equals true, and it'll give you an in place output. So by just doing this uh, simple step of uh, going from code to math and going from math to code, you actually optimize that piece of code. Um, we also have other things like you can create static vectors instead of in place vectors. Static vectors are like stack allocated because you know the size here is just three. And uh, yeah, those things are also fast and behave like abstract vectors in Julia. So, and uh, yeah, so this gets turned into machine code by Julia. Um, and Julia is, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Julia is a just-in-time compiled language. Just out of curiosity, how many of you use Julia 
in some way or form. Okay, cool, nice. Yes. Okay, so yeah, so it's generating machine code as you call the function. Um, so I wanted to try to see what we are doing in the context of other things in computer science that we know of. So first one is macros. Uh, these are syntactic macros I'm talking about, um, where you get macros take as input some expression and give out expressions, right? And these expressions are in the host programming language. So the difference here is that um, macros uh, cannot go into the caller, uh, into the functions that are called in an expression. They can only work on the top level expression. But in our case, we can send uh, kind of uh, these symbols into the functions that are being called and still get back like a simplified uh, expression. Um, and then there is abstract interpretation, which is basically taking a piece of code and interpreting it with a modified interpreter, uh, where you're saying, okay, instead of doing A plus B, uh, maybe say, uh, find the set of possible outputs of A plus B and stuff like that. Um, I, I think symbolic interpretation is also similar to this. In fact, in symbolics, you can attach metadata and kind of create an abstract interpreter uh, in itself. Um, but it's also like kind of awkward to write abstract interpreters. Um, and then it's also similar to partial evaluation, uh, which is basically you take a piece of code and evaluate it for the values you already know and then retain the rest of the code as it is. Uh, but if you run a function with symbols, that's actually what happens uh, in some sense. The only difference is uh, in all these cases, they, they think about scope, uh, where like if, if, two, two, if a function is calling another function, uh, the variables there have a different name. Uh, here, because we are passing variables through the functions, um, uh, it, it kind of takes care of itself, the, the scope. Okay, so the elephant in the room here is like Lisp. So every computer science idea has been tried out in Lisp. Uh, I'm only like 20% joking. Uh, so um, yeah, so a lot of the uh, inspiration for this package comes from uh, scheme, uh, uh, SCM utils to be exact. Uh, SCM utils is uh, Jerry, um, Professor Jerry Sussman's, uh, um, um, I guess it's a, it's a tool for doing math. He uses it for symbolic computing. Uh, um, and uh, simulating multi-body physics, basically. Um, yeah, so with, with Lisp, again, uh, most of the systems I've seen, they use Lisp symbols. Uh, you cannot have uh, the symbolic types attached to them very easily without writing another system which overlays on top of this, uh, which is also in his book. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, um, I think, uh, Sim what Symbolics is, uh, is doing is uh, kind of more uh, user-friendly and transparent. Um, I so in, the, in this section, I want to talk about all the optimizations this system makes possible. Uh, basically, the system of taking numerical code and running it with symbols and turning it back into code. Um, so the first optimization uh, we uh, do is uh, here's a function which uh, it's not important what the contents are, but it's taking a three-dimensional input, um, and it it is creating a out, uh, it is creating a um, one-dimensional output, um, and if you take the Jacobian of this uh, of this function, uh, so J uh, Jacobian is a, a derivative of R n to R m function. Uh, it looks something like this. Uh, here the yellow spots are zeros, and the uh, red spots are non-zeros. So th this function is a 72 to 72 function. So if you computed every single derivative in this Jacobian, it would take like 5,000 different symbolic computations, which is very slow. Um, but there are only hundreds of non-zero elements in this. So what we can do with symbolics is uh, run this code with on symbols and then 
we have a way to find sparse Jacobians, which is just saying, does this expression contain this input? Does this expression contain this input? So you get back the sparsity beforehand, and then you can just go to the non-zero places and then do the derivatives. And if you're also doing AD, um, which is our automatic differentiation, um, so in AD, you would have to perturb every input separately. So like this function would have to be called 72 times. But if you had this sparsity pattern, then you will know that like two, these two different things can be perturbed at the same time without the perturbations interfering with each other. So then you, you can do less than 72 calls to the function to find the derivative. Um, this is one optimization that is possible. Um, so he, in this case, we are actually finding the Jacobian function, which again, we compile down to Julia and then give it to the solver if it needs it. Um, and the second case is uh, sparse Hessians. So this is uh, kind of cool, like we can write these rules which turn expressions into their equivalent polynomial with the same Hessian. Uh, so in this case, degree to rad is a linear function. Uh, so it's just for turning degrees to radians. Uh, so it returns the polynomial x1 and log x1 is a nonlinear function. It has the same Hessian as x squared. So we just store x squared there. And then, um, yeah, in this case, x1 by x4, it's nonlinear in x4, but linear in x1. And the expression which has the equivalent Hessian is x1, x4. So basically, we can take any expression and turn it into a polynomial and then find the Hessian of the, Hessian sparsity of the polynomial and then go to, the, go to find the Hessians, which will be much faster. Uh, Okay, so here's an example of a piece of code which we, we uh, sped up using all these techniques. So here, uh, this function takes as input a 3D, uh, 3D array, U, and then it allocates three slices of it first. I mean, it extracts three slices of it, and then it does, uh, it does uh, these operations, and then it creates three different out, output arrays and then again concatenates them in, in the third dimension. So it, it takes a 3D array and outputs a 3D array. Um, and this at dot is a macro which is saying do all of these element wise, right? So, um, so it's actually doing three and uh, three allocations here and three allocations here, right? And then again, this is a big allocation here at the end where you're concatenating. And there are allocations here too. Uh, but if we, um, if we uh, run it with symbols, here du is the result of running it with symbols and call build function on it. And build function also has this feature of uh, being able to turn code into multi-threaded code by just uh, passing in this thing, uh, which I will get to later. But, um, so if, if you ran this solve with the sped up version of it using symbolics, you get a 150 times speed up. And about like 30 times is just from removing those allocations. Um, yeah. And then another cool optimization that's possible is in the same system actually, um, if you call this function called semilinear form, uh, what it does is it, it takes a list of expressions du and then it will turn it into this form. So where A is a matrix, A times U plus Y gives back du. And A and Y are outputs of semilinear form. So Y is a list of nonlinear terms and A is a matrix which when multiplied with u will give you all the linear terms in the expression. And it turns out the sparsity of A is something like this. Um, it only has 9,088 stored items. If this was very dense, then this would be even more powerful, right? Because A star u here would call the blast expression. And then instead of computing all those expressions separately, you would just call blast. In this case, it's doing a matrix vector multiply with a sparse, sparse matrix, which is also pretty fast. And the big advantage here is if you run this in Julia, this compiles very fast uh, as compared to 
compiling a list of uh, 3,000 expressions. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about compiling this to Julia. Um, so compiling to Julia and how, com how Julia itself compiles to machine code. Um, so Julia is a just-in-time compiled language. So when you call a function with a set of values, it takes the types of that, the inputs, and then propagates those types into the function and all the called functions, and then compiles each one as it figures out what the type is of each, um, each value that it's getting. And once it is compiled, the second time you run it with the same set of types, it uses the compiled code. Um, so the first time you run it, everything is very slow. Um, and the second time, it's super fast. Um, but there is a restriction bec uh, to make this happen safely, and that resti restriction is that uh, if you evaluate a piece of code, uh, you cannot run that same piece of code in the same function. Like if you, if you evaluate a, p a piece of code which returns a function, you cannot run that in the same uh, function. And this is because um, this could have invalidated some method that's uh, already defined. And uh, we maintain something called the world age. So when we call this function, this world age is uh, too old uh, or too new for, uh, to be running in the same world. So you kind of have to exit this loop of interpretation and come back and run this bar to be able to uh, run it in a valid way. So there's a kind of a workaround for this in Julia. It's called runtime generated functions. This is the package. Uh, it's written by Chris Foster. Um, what it does is uh, it takes, so when you construct a RGF, it takes an expression and it uh, hashes it and it stores it in a hash table. And then it returns a type, which is parameterized by the hash. So when it, this type is callable, and when you call this callable type, it looks up the uh, expression that is stored and it gives it to the compiler. Uh, it's a roundabout way of saying, uh, okay, I, I know you don't want me to do it, but please do it. Um, so this is what we use when we uh, use it in symbolics. Um, yeah, so in Julia, uh, compilation is, um, it's, it's um, quadratic in the length of the code that you write. Um, it's just because there's a lot of bookkeeping to do within the same function. So one thing we can do is um, if, if your function turns out to be pretty long, we can split it up into a hierarchy of function calls. That's what Symbolics does if your function is uh, pretty big. And it also turns out that if you just put at spawn in front of each of these function calls, it, it becomes multi-threaded. So this is what the multi-threading, multi-threaded form does. And uh, in Julia, there's like a work stealing multi-threading scheduler, so like you just, um, do a bunch of spawns and it takes care of load balancing. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I think uh, that's all about compilation that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but if you have questions, you can ask me. Um, so um, a, a really cool feature of symbolics is symbolic arrays. Um, symbolic arrays are not very common in symbolic algebra systems. Um, most algebra systems just work on scalars, um, variables which are real or floating point uh, seeming. And what do I mean by symbolic arrays? I, uh, so yeah, here's a table with all the things that support symbolic arrays. Uh, Maple does not. I, I think uh, Simulink also kind of does not. Uh, SymPy, SimEngine does not. Mathematica does with the assumptions thing. Um, Maxima does it, and Symbolics does it. Um, yeah, by symbolic expressions, I mean, uh, symbolic array expressions, I mean expressions which, are, which do not depend on the size of the input. So in this case, this variable is one to m, one to n. It does not matter what m and n are. It's going to take up a constant amount of space. Um, and this expression, it does not matter what the size of W and X are, it's gonna just take up a constant amount of space. Um, yeah, we already saw this, um, just, just to 
go over it again. If you use at variables with the sizes, you get back uh, array variables, and you can do operations on them. Um, and it just keeps returning the equivalent expression, right? And these things in the square brackets here, they are uh, showing the size of the output. Um, and there's like, uh, if you look under the hood, if you set this flag, it tells you what it's actually storing um, under the hood, like for every operation that you do. So if you do x star y here, it actually stores this expression. Um, and uh, this is something known as the Einstein summation notation. Um, what it means is uh, f to compute this output, uh, this output has one dimension, and for every element in that dimension, I um, compute this. And wherever there is a missing di a dimension on the right hand side, like k is not mentioned in the left, uh, left hand side, that means reduce over k using the plus operation. So here it's, uh, this is a matrix vector multiply and this, if you wrote a for loop for this, uh, it would reduce over the k and uh, the output will be filling up using the i over there. Um, and it also kind of nests into itself. So in this case, we are doing three, three expressions here, three broadcast expressions. And actually, this transpose is another one. So the innermost expression, um, huh, I think there's a typo there. It should be ji, but oh, yeah. Actually, no, there's no typo. So this is a vector transpose. So it, it's um, making the first dimension one and the second dimension n. And then this is the broadcast of uh, multiplying x with y. And this outer one is just doing exp on everything, this uh, calling exp on every element. Um, so and then we have this rule system. I'm just showing it now, but uh, rule system works on non-array variables as well. Um, so he, you, can, you can say match this pattern and rewrite it as this. In this case, adjoint of an adjoint is the thing itself. That's what it says. And then uh, the second one is more complicated. Here you're saying uh, if there, there, are, there are two multiplications, and it turns out that the size for the intermediate variable for this association is lesser than that for this one, then do this instead. So um, it's saying if a, a times b is bigger than b times c, just compute b times c first so that you don't have to allocate a bigger, um, bigger chunk of memory. Um, so if you, this will optimize things like matrix, matrix, matrix times, matrix times vector. Um, it will make it matrix times vector times, um, and then matrix times vector. Um, and then the, the second one is a broadcast fusion. So if you have x dot plus, y dot plus, z, it'll do, um, it'll do one for loop instead of two for loops. So th this rewrite system is, uh, is from this book uh, by Jerry Sussman and Chris Hansen. Um, uh, it's very cool. I think uh, it's worth a read. I think everyone here will enjoy it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, here's an example of applying a rule. So here I've written a rule which says uh, it's the uh, matrix chain multiplication rule. So just minimize the size, and my input is uh, x x times y times b, and I wanted to make it y times b times x. Um, and sure enough, the, if you apply the rule, it's, it's giving me y times b first, and then doing a star on, the, on x after that with the vector. And yeah, so build function also works on these array op. You can actually directly write array ops. This is the first time I'm showing that. But if you write this, it'll make a for loop for you. Um, using the Einstein notation. And then there is this macro called at turbo, which is like, um, 
it's, it's a very simple macro to use, but very complicated to implement. Uh, so there is this package called loop vectorization. It takes uh, any loop you give, uh, you give it and then tries to make, use SIMD on it. Uh, SIMD is like, a, it's, it's, it's instruction level parallelism. Um, so if you have, if you have uh, any modern processor, it can do multiple multiplications and additions at the same time rather than doing one at a time. But you are expressing for loops where you're saying do this one at a time, but at Turbo make sure it's doing it all at once. It's using all of those registers. And, and at Turbo is also like, it also tries to reorder the loops so that it's, it's uh, very crash friendly. And I think going forward, they're also trying to implement blocking, which will be, which will make it basically as fast as BLAST in the end. Um, this language also has uh, stencils. Um, um, stencils are basically when you have an array and then at every step, you're looking at some neighbors of, the, of, that, of that element and then doing something to the neighbors. Um, in this case, this is like a 1D stencil on a, on a 2D array. So it's basically, um, it's, it's, a, it's adding two elements in the same row. I think this second line is repeated. I should probably have removed it, but yeah. Uh, and then it has some boundary conditions at the, for the edges. Um, I try to come up with like very complicated languages for writing stencils, but in the end, this was like so simple and it, it uh, seemed pretty obvious, like where you say, I'm creating a new array Y where these components come from this expression, that's all. And it turns out to work very well. Um, I, the only thing it cannot do currently is periodic boundary conditions where you're like at the, which means that when you're at the end of the matrix, you want to wrap around and come here. Um, for that, you need to be able to self-reference, which I'm working on, but yeah. Um, and here's another example. You can have any expression as, um, as one of the components of your stencil. Not, not only array of expressions. And when you do code gen on this, it'll figure out the best way to run it. And in this case, it figured out that the second expression is just a mul multiply, and then it figures out the right view and then calls multiply on the view for the out to get the output. Um, yeah, I think um, recently there is a lot of interest in um, array languages um, where like they encode sizes in the type system uh, Dex is one of them, and um, I don't know, maybe there are other examples that I'm forgetting. Um, and I think doing it in the type system is, is great, but I think it's also kind of awkward. You're trying to um, write all of this at the compiler level, but you can actually do it um, at the very dynamic level, at, at the Julia level, for example. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so there, there is, uh, there are a lot of details about like how the system works. Like uh, in the beginning you saw that x plus x plus y is written as two x plus y. So it actually just creates um, a dictionary wrapped around in a type. Um, where it's st storing that X is repeated twice and Y is repeated once and so on. Um, but we only have one system which does the rewrite rule and there is an interface which bridges the gap between the expression representation and how the rewrite system works. And that is described in this paper. Um, and we also, in this paper, there's an example of uh, uh, using e-graphs. Um, e-graphs is this uh, new thing, it, it was, it's actually pretty old, but it was only used in um, um, theorem provers before. And what e-graphs are uh, is like, if you give it a set of rules which are bi-directional, it can figure out, it can basically search all possible expressions without 
without uh, creating an exponential blow up of memory. Um, it's, uh, there is an example of that in, in this paper and we, we have been using it to optimize floating point expressions. So if, you, if you're given an expression, how can you rearrange this expression such that um, you're not losing accuracy but also you're minimizing the amount of CPU cycles it takes. Um, and we are also st still working on a new system to do that as well. Um, yeah, and these are my collaborators. Yingbo, um, Alessandro wrote the uh, eGraph system. Chris Rakakis uh, wrote uh, the modeling package that uses this. Um, and that is used by uh, about 70 other packages. Um, the modeling language is called, uh, is called modelingtoolkit.jl. Uh, if you have a modeling uh, problem, you can try look at it because it can it can work with a large number of different types of ODE problems or differential equation problems. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's uh, all I have for today. And yeah, if you have, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer.